this. It takes two people to use this. There are two poles. And on the top there are floats and on the bottom there are weights. Kyle, you want to talk a little bit more about it? I think. Sure. So uh, the you'll see us in operation in a little bit, but the idea behind this is that two people go into the water. Uh, you stand uh, far enough apart so that the net can be stretched out and you walk parallel to the shore uh, and then eventually you kind of scoop in to uh, create like a pocket in the net and these uh, floats will keep the top part of the net floating up and the weights on the bottom uh, should stay relatively in contact with the bottom so no fish or animals can swim underneath it and hopefully everything will get caught in that pocket. So I think we can hand this off to Captain Ian and we'll show you how it's done. <laughs> All right. All right, so uh, I'm going to head into the water. I'm a little taller, so I'm gonna to choose to go in a little bit deeper than Marissa. Uh, but the major idea is to keep the poles kind of pointed out forward and uh, making sure that that bottom weighted line is in contact with the bottom so nothing can escape and we're just going to kind of walk over this uh, benthic habitat here lots of uh, little rocks and patches of algae uh, where a lot of organisms can hide in here uh, and that's what's really great about this kind of ecosystem uh, this salt marsh is an estuary that's fed uh, by the tides and the Pequannock River. Uh, so it floods with uh, the flood tide and it can get a little bit more shallow as the tide goes out. Uh, but it's a lot more calm on this side of the barrier island than it is uh, on the part that's connected to Long Island Sound. Uh, it doesn't get as wavy here. It's nice and flat and muddy and uh, calm waters. So a lot of different organisms use this environment as a uh, a nursery kind of habitat. Uh, so lots of young will um, be raised here. Uh, it's really calm and it can actually warm up a lot in the summertime. So it stays warm, calm. There's lots of food as well. Uh, all this mud is rich in nutrients and the river brings more in as well. Uh, so especially this time of year during the spring eutrophication when everything's kind of growing a lot more. Uh, that's when there's uh, ample food available. So we start to see lots of organisms coming in here. All right, so we'll see if, uh, that was just a quick one to show you how it works, but uh, I'm gonna turn in this way and we'll see if we caught anything. And after that, we can show you what we caught on our seines just before we started this live video. All right, so as we come in, you notice we're keeping that weighted line down towards the bottom just so nothing can sneak out. And we can stretch it out and see if there's anything in there. So I see one already. Yeah. Looks like a green crab. That's a male. Very nice. And a killifish. All right. So we have our sample bucket over there. We'll get these animals in here. I'm going to continue just to make sure there's nobody else trapped in the net while she's getting that so we can get them into the water as quickly as possible. Oh, oh. So we have some shrimp as well. So we do see a lot of biodiversity in this kind of habitat uh, just because there's so much food available. There's lots of different organisms that can take advantage of that. You know, everyone wants a calm, productive area to uh, lay their eggs or have their babies. So uh, we see a lot of different kinds of species here. All right, so we have our sample bucket here. Lyman Memorial. Yay! All right, shout out to Lyman Memorial for tuning in today. Uh, if anyone, oop. so it looks like there's a jelly here. Too, or, all right. So that looks like a juvenile lion's mane jelly. Let's see if we can rinse it off a little bit. It was kind of uh, stuck with a bunch of rocks and everything. Uh, so if you have any questions about what we're doing today, go ahead and leave them in the comments. We'll try and. Uh, get to them as we see them. They, there is a little bit of a delay as they come in, but we'll keep an eye out for that. Also, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from so we can see what school systems are watching. 
and how far we're reaching. All right, doesn't look like there's anybody else in here. All right, so let's take these uh, specimens back uh, to identify, and we can talk about what we caught today. All right. Let's see, so it looks like we have uh, that biodiversity I was talking about. We have a bunch of different kinds of animals uh, at various life stages as well. As well. So we have some juveniles. Uh, this green crab isn't uh, quite an adult yet. Uh, and that lion's mane was small as well. But we have some cool things to talk about. So we'll see if we can get them into some of these uh, viewing containers. And we can show you what we caught before as well. So they want to know if the jellyfish can sting. Yes, that jellyfish can sting. Uh, we actually got two kinds of uh, similar organisms in here. Let's see if I can find them for you. Uh, so we have one kind of jelly that stings and one kind of jelly that doesn't sting. So uh, these ones are actually a little easier to see in the water. Uh, but we can see if you can get this on camera. Can you see that? All right, so this is called a a tinafore or a comb jelly and you may not be able to pick it up on the camera but it's actually kind of sparkling like shiny green colors these are bioluminescent so there's bacteria in their bodies that uh, produce these colors uh, all along those little ridges those are combs so this is a kind of jelly that doesn't sting it doesn't have stinging cells it just has uh, cilia so it can kind of trap uh, plankton uh, and move it towards its mouth uh, the other kind that I picked up, that lion's mane, that kind does have stinging cells. So you have to be a little bit more careful with that. Uh, but they don't really bother me. Uh, it's, it kind of depends on how sensitive you are to it. Some people are allergic to their stings and they have a really bad, bad reaction. Uh, some people can handle them with no problem. So this one, it's kind of torn up, but uh, yeah, there's definitely stinging cells on it. It's a little mushed up, but I'm going to try and pick it up here. So you can see, whoop. Someone's asking if we got a moon jelly. Uh, no moon jellies. Uh, the, that is a, a common animal that we do find in here. They get brought in with the tide. So as the tide comes in, plankton like jellyfish will be brought in with it. Uh, so we see all sorts of kinds of jellyfish in here. Any kind that live around Long Island Sound or in the estuary. So uh, moon jellies, lion's manes, uh, sometimes clinging jellyfish as well. Uh, so we see all sorts of different kinds of plankton that get f forced in here when the tide comes in. All right. all right, and we got a couple different kinds of crabs here as well. So really common in this salt marsh area are these uh, long-wristed hermit crabs. So you'll see them kind of wandering around the mud, picking out little morsels of food as they crawl along. Uh, taking out tiny mollusks and worms and things like that. You see they have these really long kind of skinny claws. Uh, so they're good for picking up small morsels. Uh, I don't have to worry about this one's pinch either because their claws are so tiny. Uh, but we have a few different species of hermit crab that we can find in here. This one is the long wrist. And the shell that it's inhabiting uh, belongs to a uh, snail that inhabits this area as well. All right, and the other crab that we caught today it's a green crab. So we talked about these on our previous Facebook Lives. Uh, this one is a juvenile. Uh, so I did mention that this kind of habitat is really uh, used as a nursery. So lots of organisms will grow up here before they move out to the near coastal waters or Long Island Sound. And continuing on with that thought of a nursery, I want to show you uh, this bin, actually, we put the animals in here because they're a little bit easier to see in this white bin rather than the uh, clear tank or the orange bucket. So these are juvenile flatfish. We have a couple different species of flounder here. Uh, so at this point in their life stage, their eyes have rotated uh, onto the side of their body and they're laying flat. Uh, before this, when they're first hatched from their eggs, they actually swim around like you would expect a normal fish to swim, uh, with one eye on either side of the body. Uh, then that eye migrates over the top, and they settle down to the bottom. So we caught these ones right flat against the mud. Uh, this one, you can see its mouth is on this side of the body, so if I were to turn it with its mouth on the bottom, its eyes would be on the right side of its body, so we can tell that it's a right 
eyed flounder. So this I would expect to be a juvenile winter flounder. We did also catch this little one. Now they may look pretty similar right now, uh, but this one, if it reaches adulthood, will grow a lot bigger. Uh, you can see if I, uh, it's on the, the eyes are on the opposite side of the body, so it's a left-eyed flounder. Uh, this one I expect to be a summer flounder or a fluke. So if you uh, like fishing in the uh, near coastal estuary or sometimes you go out deeper waters uh, closer to the race, uh, a lot of fishermen will go for uh, these animals. This is a very prized sport fish and a lot of people eat around here. So if you eat seafood in this area, this is a very important kind of ecosystem uh, because the, before the big fish get big and you're catching them out there, they're in here uh, growing up and feeding on all the uh, small microorganisms in this uh, nursery habitat. All right, so uh, there were a couple other things that I can touch on real quick as well. So one more fish that we find commonly in this area. Let's see. I'm actually going to put it, them in this, uh, in this tank here so we can see them swimming around. All right, so this first one is called a stickleback. Let's see if we can get the camera on there. Uh, and they have tiny little spines on their back there. This one's really small, so you can just barely see them. Uh, but they have this really long, slender body that's good for fitting into uh, algae dense habitats. So we do get a lot of uh, thick algae growth in here because the water moves so slowly and there's a lot of sunlight and nutrients. So we get big thick patches of algae that lots of animals like to hide in, including this stickleback. So they will hunt along that algae, uh, picking off little uh, morsels of uh, amphipods and arthropods. Greta wants to know if they're minnows. Uh, so this one is not a minnow. Yeah, uh, minnow is a pretty common term for a lot of different small fish. So I can understand uh, where that question comes from. We did actually get a sheep's head minnow in here, I believe. So I can show that to you real quick. Let's see. Whoop. All right. So there are other species of fish in here, including minnows. So the minnow, the stickleback, and the killifish <laughs> are all really common in here. Uh, these animals. Uh, live in similar habitats. They like to hunt in the algae, uh, eating similar things as well, but there's enough food here for everybody. And these animals are, uh, they like to live in this environment mostly because they can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions. Uh, so this is a very changing habitat. Uh, as the tide goes out, uh, it can be more influenced by the freshwater river input, so it can become a little bit fresher. Uh, as the tide comes in, it gets saltier, so they have to deal with a wide range of salinities. Also in the summertime, uh, this can get really warm. Uh, as the, When the tide goes out, the volume of water in this marsh uh, will get lower, and there'll be less water here as it goes out into the sound and ebbs out. And uh, then it can spend all day baking in the sun, and that can really increase the temperature as well as the salinity due to the evaporation. So these have to be hardy little fish in here if they're going to stick around here all the time. So Greta wants to know, does a killifish like to kill things? <laughs> it is a predator, so it does kill little bugs and uh, mollusks and arthropods. Um, so it does kill things. <laughs> because it is a predator, but only a little thing. So you don't have to worry about it if you're going swimming. Do we have any other questions about the animals that we caught today? Um, what, I've heard of them as a nearshore fish. Do you want to explain that? Uh, sure, so the nearshore fish, um, the, basically we, that's a term that we use to describe uh, any species of fish that lives near the coast here. Uh, so typically they like to interact with the uh, uh, with the beaches, with the benthic substrate, so uh, they don't like wide open areas. They like um, rocky ter uh, rocky substrates and places to hide. Uh, so we find them commonly close to shore, not so much out in the deep water. And 
how are they connected to the ecosystem and the food web? All right. And uh, these, all these uh, nearshore fish are really important for the ecosystem here. Uh, they're a good source of food for uh, migrating birds as well, and uh, nearshore birds, as well as larger fish and people. Um, so these are feeding all the bigger fish in this area as well. So uh, some of them, like these flounder, uh, start out in this habitat and get bigger. Uh, and while they're at this stage, they're a source of food for larger fish as well, but then eventually they'll get bigger. And some of these smaller fish are going to be uh, prey for their whole life. So birds, large fish, and uh, other predators are going to be taking advantage of that as well. All right, Greta wants to know if you can tell whether the flounders are boys or girls. At this size, we cannot tell. The, these ones are juveniles. Uh, when they're a little bit bigger, we can tell. The, for the summer flounder, the females get bigger than the males. And uh, for the winter flounder, there is a tiny bit of difference between them as well. You can uh, tell by the uh, shape of their bodies and scales. But while they're this big, it's, they're too young to tell the difference. All right, so I want to just make sure that I'm not missing anything in this bucket real quick. It looks like we got to talk about everything. All right, well, I want to thank you all for tuning in to this Facebook Live video, uh, talking about saning, hand saning, and the uh, salt marsh pond here. Um, tune in next Tuesday. We have uh, another Facebook Live coming up at 9.30 in the morning, and uh, we'll see you next time.